All right, good morning. Why don't you come on in, have a seat, make yourself comfortable. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you so much for the ability to meet with you as a church family. And Lord, I just thank you that you have brought us together yet again. God, I just ask for for those that are here this morning that have a a struggle, a deep struggle, maybe even a struggle with same-sex attraction, Lord, I just ask that you would speak to them this morning. Lord, I just pray for every single one of us. This topic is a pretty serious topic. It's one where so many of us have different emotions about it and different convictions and maybe anger um, and maybe a lot of sorrow too. I'm sure that every single person in this room has been impacted to some degree by the topic. So Lord, we just want to give you ourselves this morning. We want to give our hearts to you and ask that you greet us with humility and teach us this morning. We love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Sound booth team, just so you know, there's some buzzing going on right here. You want to take care of that? Um, all right. Well... Hi, this morning we are going to continue our series from the last many weeks. We've been going through, how in the world do I know that I'm saved? And last week I gave the message that if you are saved, it is going to come through in what you do. I mean, how absurd is the idea that you could have the most high God living inside of you and dwelling you and then that doesn't show up somehow in your behavior. That's an absurd thought. And if you don't do anything with your faith, if your faith does not produce some kind of deeds, then your faith is dead. It's not, it's not really faith. It comes as a package deal. Faith all by itself will display good deeds. It's going to come out. That is what the first John made very, very clear. One of the number one evidences of a saved person is indeed what they do. And so last week we tackled a very difficult verse, um, and that was 1 John 3, 8. And it says this, he who practices sin is of the devil. And we studied that passage together, and we looked at the Greek, and we looked at all kinds of different other passages where that same word was used with the same tense and everything. And we came up with the even more dynamic English version translation. Where is Kurt? Why was he not here last week for that joke? And why is he not here this week for this joke? (laughs) Anyway, here's the translation that we came up with. A person who identifies with sin and makes it the settled path and pursuit of their life is of the devil. And so this week, what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue from that message last week. And I told you last week that I was going to go after a specific sin that millions and millions of supposed Christians would say, no, it's not sin. It can't be sin because... I was born this way. And so, yes, this morning we are going to be talking about the lifestyle of homosexuality and how our culture is trying to erode the church away by shaming us for telling the truth. They're trying to silence us. So if you're here this morning, I just want to let you know, if you're here this morning and you struggle with same-sex attraction, I recognize how prevalent that that is in our culture today Or maybe you just know people, you know someone that struggles with same-sex attraction. Please hear me. I love you, God loves you, and there is a very real solution to your pain. There's a very real solution to your pain. So please, if you're struggling with that right now, I'm just begging you, please don't shut me out. Don't tune me out this morning. God has a path for you that is so much more joyful and so much more pain-free than the current path that you're on. You have been bathed. I just want to let you know if if that is your struggle this morning, you have been bathed in prayer. May God fill you with his love this morning and replace that terrible hurt that overwhelms you. So our text this morning, 1 John 1, verses 5 through 10. This is the message that we have heard from him and announced to you. God is light And in in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, 
We lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus' his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My primary point this morning, the thing I want you to grab a hold of is all of us, every single last one of us, were born in darkness. All of us were. In other words, all of us were born this way. And the only solution for every single one of us is light. So let's start off and let's talk about that light. Point number one, light can be offensive, right? Our text says that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Light is extremely offensive. It can be extremely offensive. You know what I mean by that, right? Like just stare at the sun for two seconds and you'll find out how offensive light is. And that's just one of trillions of trillions of stars that God created. And God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. I just imagine, take all those trillions of stars, every single last one of them, bring them all together into one giant light and that's what you have as God. It'd be even brighter than that. I can't imagine how offensive that light would be. We would not be able to be in his presence, and scripture definitely backs that up. And so, if light is offensive, and you are a person who has that light living in you, then naturally what's going to happen is you are going to be offensive. It's just going to happen, and so we ought to get used to it. We ought to uh, be ready, expect it. But the world has gotten us to cave to our culture lately, (laughs) The world has gotten us Christians to dance like those old cowboy, there you go. (laughs) That's how we can feel as, as Christians sometimes. The world has forced us to qualify everything we say for 15 minutes before we get to say that homosexuality is a sin, right? Imagine with me, if you will, just think about this for a second. Let's just say that I wanted to talk about the Hamas group, those, the, the group of terrorists that have attacked Israel. And I wanted, to talk to, I wanted to talk about that. But I opened my message with, guys, these Hamas people, they're just so misunderstood. You know, if, if we just meet them where they're at, and if we just listen to them, then we'll find out why they chop the heads of babies off. And we'll find out why they put a bunch of children in a room and set it ablaze. And it'll make sense to us. And we'll find out why they opened an elderly woman's Facebook Live so that they could broadcast her murder to her family and friends. You know, congregation, I just want to make sure that you guys don't think that I'm intolerant of them. I don't want you to think or get the impression at all that I hate them personally. They just have this difficult plight. They were born this way. And so yes, I am gonna call out their behavior and technically, I guess it's probably sin, we should label it that technically, but I know it and I understand it. And so I'm not mad at a person who does that, I understand it. And so, yeah, I don't want to make too big of a deal out of it, but technically I can't support that behavior. Or if I was talking to someone that was a part of that group and my spirit, my attitude towards them was, you understand where I'm coming from, right? (laughs) Like, put yourself in, in my shoes and I was raised this way and so you understand where I'm coming from. Like, you're not mad at me, are you? We're, we're cool. Guys, if... Imagine if I spent 15 minutes of a message about that, and that's how I opened the message. I think you guys, if I spent 15 minutes trying to make sure that you guys aren't mad at me when I tell you that it's wrong to burn children, I think you guys would probably question my sanity a little bit. So why do we do this when we speak about homosexuality? Well, we as in we as in the American church, because the culture has gotten a death grip on our fear, we are afraid that if we teach outright that it is sin, well, then people will call us intolerant, 
They will call us judgmental. They will, sell, they will say that pointing out our darkness, that equates to a lack of love. And they'll say that we don't understand and that we're claiming to be superior to them and that we are more righteous and deserving of God's love. Guys, nobody in this room is more deserving of God's love than anyone else. I am no better than anyone else in this room and neither is anyone else. Why? Because we were all born this way. We were all born in darkness, and we all need the same solution, which is light. And so in our fear, what has happened is we cower, and we give the culture more more ground. Okay, so how how has that been working out for us? (laughs) The last 40 years, how's the church been doing by defending itself this way and caving and justifying everything and giving all these qualifying statements? The last 40 years, ever since Westboro Baptist Church was on Oprah, for crying out loud, we've been doing this, and the only thing that's happened is the church has declined faster and faster and faster. It's not working out for us. It hasn't been. And we have just been saying, well, okay, we just need to be more seeker-sensitive, right? We just need to be as soft as we can and as mellow as we can and as nice as we can, as polite as we can, and then maybe they will esteem us, and then maybe they will value us. I mean, esteem God, value God, right? Our aim is in the wrong direction. So I need you to understand that pointing out darkness, that does not equate to a lack of love. Rather, pointing out darkness is itself love. It is saying to an unrepentant sinner, I am afraid for your death. I need you to turn around. So, question. Did Jesus ever act unloving? <laughs> Show of hands. Anybody willing to stand there? Jesus ever act unloving? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think so. So, yeah. Jesus was love with everything that he did. Even when it was harsh, even when he was going after people, everything was from a place of love. Now, did Jesus care about being seeker sensitive? Did he care about pandering to the false religious culture that he was in? No. He used the phrase, you hypocrites, over and over and over again throughout scripture. He said harsh words like, you blind guides, you whitewashed tombs, you brood of vipers, turn and repent. You make people twice as much a son of hell as you are. Woo, man, woe to you. If Sodom and Gomorrah had seen and heard what you have seen and heard, they would have repented long ago. No, Jesus did not pander to proud people. He called them to repent. He didn't care about the size of the crowd, right? When he gathered a crowd of 5,000 people, he was not just like doing everything in his emotions and in his thoughts, trying to figure out how in the world do I make sure that all these people stay with me? He didn't care about that at all. I mean, what, what did he do? With that crowd, after, after he had done that, he, had, he said to them, the only reason you have came and, 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 and follow me is because your, 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 your bellies have been filled and you've been a little entertained. Well, I've got news for you. I am not here to feed you and I am not here to entertain you. And then he said this crazy statement. He said, if you want to follow me, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. He just shined this big old spotlight out there to test who's really mine, and then they all just scattered. And Jesus turns to his fellow disciples, and he says to them, so are you going to desert me too? And Peter, in a stroke of genius, he says, where else are we going to go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Jesus cared more about the truth and way more about the supreme virtue of Christianity, which is humility, He cared way more about that than he did the size of the crowd. And guys, this church will always, as far as I'm concerned, model ourselves that way. Did Jesus shy away from being the light? No, he did not. And then he says to us, in Matthew 5, 14 and following, he says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. 
Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they set it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Our task, ladies and gentlemen, as Christians, is to shine our light. That is what we do. And the reason we shine our light is because there's, there's two impacts that the light has on other people. You need to understand that one thing it does, light, it draws humble people. And at the same time, light repels proud people. And that's exactly what Jesus wanted. And that's also exactly what we want. Jesus didn't sulk and cry when proud people fled from him. And we don't sulk and cry when proud people flee from us either. I don't mean to be harsh, I'm not trying to be harsh, but I don't want proud people in this church. I don't want it. Jesus doesn't want proud people in this church. Proud people, what they do is they hurt others. They divide the flock, they drain all, their, all the resources, they bring drama and relational strife, and they keep true, peaceful, loving ministry from taking place. They, do, they can just zap up hundreds and thousands of hours from true love being able to be spread inside the church. And there's one way to solve this, and that is to shine the light. The light will do the work for you. It will draw the right people, and it will repel the right people. And my hope and prayer this morning is that Every single person in this room, my open prayer is that you are one of those humble people and that you are being drawn by God's love. I mean, why do you think, why do you suppose that this church is so healthy? It's because we do this. We shine our light. Sometimes, does that repel people? Yep, it sure does. And that's just fine. Jesus isn't worried about that and neither are we. So often, as, as the pastors pace up and down these aisles in the sanctuaries, we pray every day for you during the week. So often, our prayer is, God, keep the, humble, keep the humble people here and protect us from the proud people. Don't let proud people come in. If proud people come and visit and they have no intention of humbling themselves, they have no intention of giving their life to Christ, they have no intention of owning their sin, repenting, and doing their best to follow Jesus as the treasure of your life and not their sin. If that's who they are, God, please help them to leave and not come back. Whew. But God, if they are humble, any person, I don't care who it is, and I don't care how big your struggle is, and I don't care what deep, dark sin you have committed, that's irrelevant. If you're humble, then we want you here. If you are humble and you can take that sin and that overwhelming darkness and despair that you experience on a regular basis, and you can go, yes, I did this, and I'm sorry, and I hate it, and I can't stand what it does and how it hurts my God, then I don't care how big of a mess you are. <laughs> There's a lot of us out there. We're all a mess. I don't care how big of a mess you are. If you are humble, then God, please keep them here. But if you refuse and you're just going to be proud, then do the other. So we shine our light. We speak the truth. And Jesus, the heart of Jesus about this is, is just like shine the light and trust me with the results. Shine the light. Trust me with the results. Don't trust your seeker-sensitive human philosophies and strategies. If you shine your light, you will draw all the right people and you will repel all the right people. 2 Corinthians 2.15 says this, Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. But this fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and by those who are perishing. To those who are perishing, we are a dreadful smell of death and doom. But to those who are being saved, we are a life-giving perfume. Okay, heart check for everybody. Just let me ask you, how does this message smell to you? Does this message that I'm speaking to you right now, that God's word is illuminating to you right now, does it stink? Does it reek? Does it smell like death and doom, or do you know this is life-giving perfume? 
Yes, ladies and gentlemen, light can be offensive. But it draws us who know, yeah, I'm darkness. All of us are born in darkness. Every single one of us is born this way. And the only solution is light. Point number two. People try to remove their darkness by claiming that it is light. You know what I mean by that? Like, this can't be sin, right? God made me this way. It can't be sin. This, this person that I'm dating of the same sex, like, we're faithful together. This can't be sin, right? I'm not, this, this darkness, it's not darkness. This sin isn't really sin. I can have fellowship with the light. I can call myself a Christ follower while, stu, by, while still doing that. Okay, I want to make you aware, um, I'm sure you probably are all very aware, that this has been invading the church at large for quite some time, the homosexual, homosexual movement. Um, a lot of mainline denominations and sub-denominations of them have embraced homosexuality and even had homosexual pastors at the, the helm. So Lutheran, Methodist, Presbyterian, uh, Episcopal, Unitarian, like that was never a church to begin with, but those other denominations, they have embraced this. And I know that that's not news to you, but maybe this is. It's eking its way into the evangelical church. It's happening now. And people aren't, I mean, for, for somebody to say, oh my goodness, an evangelical church is doing this? No, that, that can't be. Yeah, it's happening right now. And I want you to know that there is a prominent pastor here in America, like a household name in the evangelical church, like a, a, an evangelical darling for the last 25 years. Andy Stanley is making room for the invasion of homosexuality into his church. And not only that, but he is training other churches how to do the same thing. Okay, it's hard to call somebody out. I recognize that because sometimes you get it wrong. <laughs> I've had people misquote me. I've had people say things that I didn't say. I just want you to know this morning what I'm giving you about Andy Stanley here this morning this is not hearsay. I'm, I'm going to quote him directly, okay? I'm going to tell you exactly what he said. It's straight from the horse's mouth. It's not telephone coming through here. This is straight from the horse's mouth, and I want you to know and understand why this is so sneaky, why it's so pervasive. It's tricky, and it's very alluring, and if people don't have their Bibles screwed on straight in their head, then they're going to fall for it. So first, I, I want to <laughs> let you know that um, the delivery, whoo, it's smooth. The delivery is so smooth, um, and it's very compelling. He did a fantastic job. You can go and look at it if you want, as from his message from a couple of weeks ago. But yeah, it's very compelling. And I gotta be honest, if I didn't have, if I was not well-versed in the Bible, I probably would have bought what he was saying. Oh, this feels so right. It's very compelling. Which has made him, I mean, he he's, has been a, a very powerful teacher for 30 years. So maybe you heard about the conference that he hosted at his church. The conference was called Unconditional. So the purpose of the conference, as he articulated it, and I'll, again, I'm going to quote him with, with these things. As he articulated, the, the conference was basically answering the question, how do you handle how do you handle it as a church and as parents when someone has the courage enough to come out, okay? That's why the conference was, was done. And the title of the conference, man, that sounds good, doesn't it? Unconditional? Man, that's a good title. You think about all the connotations of what unconditional means. I mean, it's like for crying out loud, that's the very definition of the word agape, unconditional, selfless love. My goodness, that's a good title. So the title is very intentional. And basically the message just from that title is if you treat the homosexual community different than we treat the homosexual community, well then you are not acting in, in unconditional love. You have a conditional love unlike Christ. So you see and feel the shame motivation towards the church with that, right? 
just with the title alone. Now, he says in his own defense that his church is still a Bible-believing church and that they teach the Bible. He even said this. He said, we affirm the sins that Paul says are sins. So he said that in his message. If Paul says it's a sin, we, we say it's a sin as well. But was he willing to say from the pulpit that homosexuality is a sin? Nope, he wasn't willing to, to do that. And so he wants the Christians out there in the world, all these evangelical people that are following him, they want them, he wants them to know and believe that we're on the same page. Now he also said that they have always taught what the Bible teaches about homosexuality, okay? Uh, Or excuse me, what the Bible teaches about sexuality, big umbrella, sexuality. Here's what they, here's what he says they, they adhere to. One is purity, Two is you don't abuse yourself, your, your body, or someone else's. And then three, no sex prior to marriage. Okay, that's really vague. <laughs> and not only that, but also, if you think about it, if I were, I'll just tell you this, if I were a homosexual man, <laughs> and I was interested in staying a homosexual man, I could fall in line with that easier than otherwise. Okay, purity. All right, well, I've got in my mind what I think purity is. Okay, yep, I want to be pure. Uh, don't abuse my body or somebody else's body. Yep, I can, I can be in line with that. But then he says, no sex before marriage. Eh, that'll probably be difficult, but I can solve it if I just marry my boyfriend, right? So it just is walking this line, this fine line, where all, these, all the Christians will agree and all the homosexuals will agree. So now maybe you're thinking, I'm tracking with you. I know, your your wheels are spinning here. Maybe you're thinking, well, Ben, you're being way too harsh about this. Because he said that if Paul says it's a sin, he says it's a sin. So Ben, you should back off. Okay, I hear you. But more was said. He said, quote, we don't want any gay person in our church to have a struggle with who I am is as incompatible with the church, okay? So do you see that? Who I am. He says, homosexuality is what you are. It is a category of its own. And so homosexuals, for us heterosexuals, we experience shame over what we do, but homosexuals experience shame over who they are. It's they're a different category of people. Guys, I just want to tell you, no, that is false. Every single human being that has ever existed has experienced that accusation of you are your sin. Look at how dirty you are. You are disgusting. All of us have felt that experience, right? I feel that daily (laughs) with my sin. So no, homosexuality is not different in that way. All of us were born into this darkness and there is only one solution. So a phrase that Andy made, uh, one of his favorite phrases along uh, this topic is, he says, we draw, as human beings, we draw lines where Jesus drew circles. We typically exclude people where Jesus includes people. And sure, did Jesus, there's some truth to what he's saying, which is why it's appealing. Did Jesus accept repentant prostitutes and sinners and tax collectors when everybody else was rejecting them? Yep, he did. But that's the point, isn't it? He accepted repentant, repentant people. Everyone who was humble, he drew a circle around. And everyone who was proud, he drew a line on, right? Literally the opposite of what Andy is is saying here. And with Jesus, you need to know, here in this church, that is exactly what we do. If you are humble, we draw a circle around you. If you are proud, we draw a line. That is the way this church is run. He goes on. He said that, He encourages gay people to live a celibate life. And some do, some live a celibate life even for years. But then he said, and I quote, but for most, that is just not sustainable, and so they choose same-sex marriage. 
Then he talked about his two friends. They were a married gay couple, these two men, that he's like, man, they're, they're so loving, they're so encouraging. They're our brothers in, brothers in Christ, and they're on the path with Jesus. They're followers of Jesus. They're gay, but this is the path. This is their journey that they're on. And they have taught me so much about what it's like to come out. They've taught me so much about what it's like to be gay. And so I invited them to speak at the Unconditional Conference. And so these two men spoke at the Unconditional Conference, teaching pastors how to handle this topic. And not only that, but Andy also invited those two men to teach the parents in his church how to handle it when your kids are struggling with this. Guys, <laughs> and then he says, the global church needs to learn from this. So maybe you're thinking, okay, yeah, Ben, that's still, that, yeah, that sounds sketchy. But if Andy believes that homosexuality is a sin, what's the problem? It sounds like he's got the right theology, he's just not applying it very well. No, ladies and gentlemen, he does not have the right theology. He is seriously missing what the Bible says on the topic. And 1 John, it, he needs last week's message. You know, 1 John 3.8 that we translated last week. We'll read it again. A person who identifies with sin and makes it the settled path and pursuit of their life is of the devil. That is the best way to translate 1 John 3.8. But if you are humble... And repent, and if humility is your settled path and pursuit, then you are of God, and you bet we draw a circle around that. It doesn't mean you don't sin. It doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. It doesn't mean, what it does mean is it's not your identity, and it is not your settled path and pursuit. First John 1 John 1.6, if we say we have fellowship with him, and yet we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And he says it's who they are. They are Christ followers, and I want to help my brothers on their journey. Correction, they are not Christ followers. They are not your brother. They're not. They want to walk in darkness and still have fellowship with the light. And as it pains me to say it, but it's just true. The Bible does not make room for that. You can't do that. And we as Christians, when we see someone in unrepentant sin, we have a job to do. We are supposed to shine the light. That's our task. Shine a light on it so it can be clearly identified as the devil's tool to destroy you so that you can hate it, own it, confess it, repent of it, and then commit yourself to following Jesus as your absolute treasure and not your sin. You say, okay, well, Ben, I'm not sure that that doctrine is clear in Scripture. All right, let me help us out a little bit. I'll show you. 1 Corinthians 5, 11. Now, I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, somebody who claims to be a Christian, if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, re reviler, drunkard, or swindler. Don't even eat with such a one. Galatians 6.10, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should go restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Help them to repent. Bring them back to the light. Don't leave them where they are. But keep watch over yourselves, lest you too be tempted. James 5.19 and 20, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover over a multitude of sins. That's just a short list. Here's a few other, if you, if you care to jot these down. Matthew 18, 15, Titus 2, 10, 1 Timothy 1, 20, 2 Thessalonians 3, 14, all of them saying, that is not a complete list, but all of them saying, gently restore an unrepentant sinner, and if they refuse, then you draw a line and you separate from them. Bible is clear on what to do, and unfortunately, Andy disagrees. So what, does, what did Andy do? What did Andy do when this topic came up and when two men decided that they wanted to get married? Well, did he confront them and tell them that if they don't repent, then hell is a certainty for them? Nope, that's not what he did. Instead, 
Let's give them a microphone so that they can teach our parents and our children how to be better Christians. We need to expose the darkness in order to save a soul. Point number three. Owning our darkness is actually what removes it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We must understand, ladies and gentlemen, that unrepentant sinners, those who identify with their sin, make it the settled path in pursuit of their life, those people do not belong to Christ. Those people are headed straight for hell and saying, yep, that's fine. We accept you. You don't have to try to follow scripture. Instead, here's a microphone. You teach us. Guys, that is not love. That is not love. You are putting rose petals down on their path straight to hell. And not only that, but you are helping them to drive that path so that other people can follow in their path. That is not love. That is not unconditional love. That is actually selfish. If you saw one of your friends, just think about this for a second. If you saw one of your friends, let's say you were out at a camp thing and it was a new campground, there's a big wide open area, and you're playing football together, and you're throwing the ball around, but there's a cliff that's at the edge of the field, and you got one of your buddies that's not paying much attention, and he's sprinting like he's going to go right off the edge of that cliff. What are you going to do in that situation? You are going to scream, stop, and are you going to care what he thinks? (laughs) No. Are you going to care what your friends think as you're making a fool of yourself trying to make sure that he doesn't go off the cliff? No, you're not going to care one whit about that. This is the same thing. You're going to do everything you can to make sure that they don't go off the cliff. To say, no, I don't need to tell them. That's not love. Ladies and gentlemen, what that actually is, is hate. That is straight from the devil, the king of hate masquerading as an angel of light. If you love your gay friends, those that are struggling with same-sex attraction, if you love them, you will help them. You will say something about it. Not virtue signal your compassion and empathy and say, here, teach my children. Telling them to stop is no different than asking them to do the very same thing that you have done. We are all born this way. We are all born in darkness, and the only solution is light. So no, it's not a different category of human being. Maybe it's a different category of temptation, sure. Maybe it's a temptation that most of us don't experience, but we are all tempted. We are all the same. We are all sinful. We are all dark, and we are all in need of a Savior. And all of us need to reject the way that we were born Reject our fleshly productivities and embrace the truth and have the truth set us free from the lies that we've been enslaved to. All of us are going to struggle with our own besetting sins, right? This is just true. Uh, General truth here, not, not speaking of anything specific, but it's just a general truth that oh, 90 plus percent of men, they're going to struggle in the area of, of lust, Okay, here's just a general truth that 90% of women, one of their major struggles in life is going to be worry. Okay, so does that mean then that you gals should just embrace your temptation? Well, I just am a worrier, so I guess that means I need to take advantage of every moment I can to freak out. Or for us men, well, I just am, I'm a man. I just am a guy, I just, I lust, I am lust. And so now I just need to embrace my sin and go grope every female in my, in my circle of influence. Maybe that's what, and, and hey, you can't tell me not to because that might hurt my feelings. Or maybe you struggle with coveting, right? If you struggle with coveting, well then I guess you just have to embrace that and you need to go steal everything that you want. Or maybe you struggle with anger, And you just need to embrace that. Well, I'm sorry, bucko, but you are anger. And so you just need to go around and punch everybody in the face that, you know, tweaks you from time to time. But guys, we need to see what is going on in our world. And we need to stop dancing for the culture that ultimately wants us to shut up. The culture is doing this with the church. 
Let's not get on that train. So our job is to point. The point of a lampstand is that we set it up as high as we can and as bright as we can so that as many people as possible can see it. Does that mean some will flee? Yep, that's what that means. But also, we need to see people saved. So if you're here this morning and as a Christian, you're like, oh, Ben, I don't like this message. Don't like it because you're hitting too close to home here. I have friends that are gay or I have other friends that are just on a path to hell. They are living a lifestyle of sin And I'm sorry, but I have to admit it, I really, I flee from being a light to them. It's like the last thing that I want them to know is that I'm a Christian. And I've even justified my silence by calling it love to not confront. Well, I don't want to be confrontational. Listen to me, saint. I understand. Been there. I know. That's your flesh working. We all have it. And thankfully, Christ died for that, but there is so much more worth living for than not being ridiculed by your friends. So much more worth living, namely that that friend gets to spend eternity with you and you get to be besties because you said something. Or maybe you're here and you haven't fully given your life to Christ. Maybe you are here and maybe you have that struggle of same-sex attraction. If that's you, Listen to me. I don't care what you've done. I know it is so easy to feel like you are just evil, like you are different, and like you are forever going to be alone because of the the things that you struggle with. Like you have to embrace the lifestyle because if I don't embrace this homosexual lifestyle, then I will never, ever stop feeling alone and I will never, ever be understood or accepted. I will not find love. No, God is love and he made you for love. That was the purpose of him making you And he desires to show you a love that nobody else can. There is a light at the end of this tunnel. There are people in this church that have had this struggle and been released from it. And not only that, but they are experiencing so much more joy in this life. Oh, I'm going to talk to people. Maybe we can have some testimonies sometime. But the amount of joy, and not only that, but the amount of pain that they are now not experiencing, it is It is light and it is darkness. There is, it's black and white. And so, if you are here this morning and you say, Ben, yeah, I do have that struggle. I am struggling with that, but not only that, I don't feel like I can overcome it. You don't understand how big of a struggle this is for me. Well, let me tell you, that's true. You don't have the ability to overcome this as a human being. Human beings cannot overcome this. You can't, but where you find a human being that is doing what only God can do, there you find a Christian. The only way out of this is through the Holy Spirit. That is absolutely true. So it doesn't matter what you've done or how evil you feel, Christ died for your sin. He died for your sin because he is well acquainted with your pain. And if you make Jesus your savior, if you turn to him and make him your king and treasure, not only is heaven waiting for you instead of hell, but healing and fellowship here as well. If you'd like to give your life to Christ today, then I'm just begging you, please don't leave here without talking to somebody. Feel free to approach me if you like. We would love to welcome you to the family of God and help you on your journey as you begin your journey with Jesus as your, as your treasure. Why don't you go ahead and take a, a few minutes here. You can jot some notes down, pray on your own, or talk with somebody next to you about what was most important to you from today's message.